we have arrived at the VC bound. Okay, so why is this bound important? Well, I just want you to remember that in the growth function theorem, we ran into this problem that we couldn't compute the growth function. So maybe the VC dimension will help us solve it because we can kind of compute the VC dimension, at least in some cases. Okay, so if a class of functions has VC dimension H, we know we can chatter N observations as long as N is less than or equal to H, right? This is just by the definition of VC dimension. The VC dimension is, you know, you can shatter any number of points up to that number, the VC dimension. Okay, and then in that case, um, if you can shatter those points, the value of the growth function is 2 to the n. Now, when n is greater than h, we cannot shatter those points, and the growth function is less than 2 to the n. So an interesting phenomenon, or an intriguing phenomenon, um, happens about the growth function, which is that if you plot the growth function as a function of the number of data points n, um, you see that you get exponential growth up to the VC dimension, which, you know, you expect because it's, you know, 2 to the n, right? Um, but then afterward, it becomes polynomial. So that's, that's pretty cool. And what's even more interesting is that you can upper bound the whole curve there as a function of one single number, which is the VC dimension. Okay, and in particular, there's a theorem, which is called, it's usually called Sauer's Lemma, which um, provides that exact bound. So it says, let f be a class of functions with finite VC dimension h. Then for all n, for all, you know, natural numbers, uh, then the growth function is upper bounded by a function of the VC dimension. And there are two separate bounds here. And the first one, you can see the VC dimension up in the upper part of the sum there, right? That's what that's doing. And then um, the other, the more interesting bound is the lower bound, the one uh, uh, over here, right there. And that bound says uh, that when n is greater than or equal to h, which is, you know, that's the situation we're usually in. We, we're, we usually have more data points than we can shatter with functions from the class, right? We're usually not using functions that can shatter anything, right? We don't want that. Um, so in that case, the growth function is upper bounded by this function of the VC dimension right here, okay? So the VC dimension is, appears there and there. Okay, so that's pretty cool. Now, if I take this, uh, this lemma and I plug it directly into the growth function theorem, I now have a bound on the generalization error that depends on the VC dimension, okay? So I'm just gonna show you what happens when you do that. So literally, I'm just plugging this lemma into the growth function theorem, okay? Because the growth function theorem, theorem was in terms of the growth function. And so just put an upper bound on the growth function, plug it in, okay? So that's what this uh, theorem is, the VC bound. So if the class of functions has VC dimension H um, and N is greater than or equal to H with probability at least one minus delta, so with high probability, for all functions in the class, the true risk is less than or equal to the empirical risk plus some stuff. Stuff depends on the VC dimension. Okay, so it's really nice. It's a really nice showcase of this sort of balance between empirical risk, so kind of performance on your training set, and simplicity. Simplicity measured by VC dimension, okay? So a very, very beautiful theorem there. And of course, uh, another beautiful thing about this theorem is that you can actually measure the VC dimension in some cases, um, unlike the growth function, which is much harder to deal with. Okay, so that's cool. So it's saying, you know, the difference between true and empirical risks is at most this function, which is kind of like square root of the VC dimension divided by, um, you know, the number of data points, okay? The log n is, is less important, so. In any case, that's so much better than where we were at the beginning of this whole thing, where the bound was infinite, you know? Now we're dealing with uncountably infinite function spaces, and we found a way to measure complexity or simplicity of classes of functions, and we're using that to bound the difference between um, true and empirical risks, even not knowing anything about the distribution that the data are drawn from. So that's why, these, these theor that's why this theorem is so crazily elegant. Okay, so again, why is the VC bound important? Because it's a generalization bound that's non-vacuous, even for infinite, uncountably infinite um, function classes, okay? Uh, it's a finite sample bound, so it's telling you something non-asymptotically. It tells you something for the data set you actually have. Also, VC dimension can be computed or bounded in many cases 
and it's also a beautiful combinatorial quantity. It also, the bound also tells you what quantities are important for the learning process. So as I mentioned, the quantities that are important for the learning process are to make sure the empirical risk is low, so you have to do well on your training set, but also you want to keep your class of functions simple and simplicity measured in this very general way using BC dimension. Okay, there is one caveat, which is that the bound itself is too useful to directly, to, too loose to be directly used in practice, right? You can't minimize the bound. People sometimes want to minimize the bound, but that's not really what it's for, right? You can't, ex you can't expect to minimize the bound directly and to keep the true risk low. Um, like, it, it, the bound, though, it's not designed to do that. It's to, designed to tell you what quantities are important for the learning process, right? It doesn't need to be tight to tell you what's important here. And of course, what it's telling you is important are these three things, right? The empirical risk, the BC dimension, and the number of data points you have, right? You can keep the true risk small if your empirical risk is small, if the number of data points is large, and if you have a simpler function class where simplicity is measured by the VC dimension. And you should think about regularization here as maybe helping you to look at functions with lower VC dimension. And you want to think about, you know, that regularization term, like restricting you to functions with lower complexity, right? That's the way you want to think about it. And so that's how, that's how this bound is important. It tells you what the important quantities are for the learning process, right? Empirical risk, amount of data, and the simplicity of your model class. And so now we've formalized simplicity and showed that it can help you get uh, lower task risk in this very, very general setting. Thanks.